The Stranger in Room Six The Black Penny boarding house overlooked the slag heaps of an abandoned steelworks along the coast from Cardiff. One evening, two nights before Christmas, a stranger thumped his dripping wet bag down on the wooden boards of the cramped hallway. You have a vacancy sign in the window, he said. I'd like a room. Mr. Jones, the manager, who had been dozing on his stool in the reception, forced a sleepy eye open and reached for the register, frowning. It's the last one, he grunted. This close to Christmas, you won't find one anywhere else. It was good news, really, thought Mr. Jones, having the place full over Christmas with guests who had no family to go to, but it all meant more work. Left to himself, he wouldn't bother with Christmas. Just a lot of unnecessary effort and expense, uncalled-for joviality, church music, children, look you, he shuddered. At least he didn't need to trouble over which of the six rooms the stranger should have, not that there was much to choose between them. They were all grubby and troubled with draughts from the sour wind that blew off the distant mudflats. But there was a subtle scale of surcharging that reflected, or rather exaggerated, each room's dubious merits. Room two cost more because it had a picture window, ignoring the reality that the only panorama was that of a permanently slate grey sky and the hangman's rope of potholed road that led back to the motorway. Guests in room four paid more for a television, which picked up a single Welsh-language channel. Room six, the only room left, was the smallest, coldest, and least appealing of all. Even Mr. Jones's scheming wife, author of most of the petty ruses employed by Mr. Jones to trick guests out of their money, could think of no redeeming feature that could be used as a pretext for charging more. Only when all the other rooms were occupied was room six offered, and consequently the tomb-like space with its soul-affronting view was rarely taken. It's one hundred and ten pounds a night, said Mr. Jones, doubling the usual rate. It's Christmas, see? The stranger nodded and made no response when informed that additional blankets, which he would certainly need because Mr. Jones had fixed the plug so the three-bar fire could not come on, cost extra. Mr. Jones shrugged at the lack of interest and handed the man a pen with which to sign the register. There was nothing about the stranger's manner or appearance to suggest that he was anything other than the familiar breed of trade representative or itinerant misfit who constituted the usual residence. How long will you be staying? Three days. Mr. Jones pursed his lips. You'll be wanting Christmas dinner, then. The stranger shook his head. Mr. Jones, relieved, asked for a credit card and wrote down the number, then shut the register and pushed it aside. Breakfast is eight to eight thirty. We don't do cooked. He handed the stranger a key marked with a red six. Top of the stairs, left on the landing, and it's up another flight of stairs to your left. Mr. Jones busied himself with the paperwork so as to avoid the obligation of carrying up the stranger's rain-soaked case. The man turned away and started up the stairs. Mr. Jones's father, Mr. Jones Sr., shambled into the reception, wincing at the glare of the fairy light draped round the desk. He caught sight of the strangers retreating back and stood stock still. Who's that? Just a guest. Guest? That's no guest, the old man muttered. And to his son's astonishment, Mr. Jones Sr. lifted his right hand and made the time-honoured fig sign, the index and little fingers outstretched from a closed fist in the direction of the departing figure. What the hell are you doing? Mr. Jones Jr. hissed. The old man, whose face had drained entirely of colour, ignored him. Stop that, you old fool! He'll see you! The stranger, apparently unaware of the commotion behind him, ascended the stairs and disappeared from view. The old man allowed his fist to drop. I'm getting my coat. Where are you going? Jim Thomas will put me up. I'm not staying here, Bach. Not while he's here. Not for a minute. 
Besides, he added, jerking his head towards the room behind the reception, I know she doesn't want me here. The old man returned the way he had come. His son, open-mouthed, watched him go. Mr. Jones, Jr. told his wife about the incident that evening as they sat over a supper that was rather better than anything the paying occupants of the building had been offered. Mrs. Jones, a derelict, overweight beauty with a venomous glare, tossed her head. In her opinion, and she would say it again and didn't care who heard it, it was high time the old man was put away, or something. Mr. Jones made some conciliatory remark, torn between a sharp fear of the expense of a nursing home and his unruly but only occasionally gratified lust for his wife. His father owned the business, he reminded her, and though naturally he agreed with everything she said, they must humour him in what must surely be his last years. But Mr. Jones knew what she was really suggesting, and feared that one day, perhaps soon, there would be no avoiding the conversation he dreaded. Mrs. Jones placed a podgy hand on her husband's in an unusual display of affection. She appreciated all that, and it was sweet how devoted he was to his father, but didn't he see how the old man was holding them back? If he would just hand it all over to them now, how good things would be, how very, very good. Mrs. Jones stroked her husband's bony hand with her manicured, flabby fingers and fluttered her mascarad eyelashes. Perhaps it was time he had another talk with his father about the future. She felt it was. It would be so much nicer having the place to themselves, however it was achieved. Much nicer, see? She gave his hand a squeeze. Mr. Jones swallowed. He knew his wife despised him, but then again there was the way the evil-hearted bitch filled her nightdress. He would talk to his father when he came back. If he had been asked right then what manner of man their latest guest was, Mr. Jones would have been able to say very little. A middle-aged man, in his mid-forties perhaps, average height, thinning hair, a bit depressed maybe, quite ordinary. Mrs. Jones, who had passed the stranger on the stairs as he made his way down for dinner, would have been better on the details, having taken in the huge gold ring on the first finger of his left hand, the shine on his expensive-looking Italian shoes, the brooding, sorrowful eyes. Possibly foreign, but not bad-looking all the same. In his mid-thirties, maybe. She had spoken to him later, as she served coffee from a caffetiere, it was instant, but no one ever noticed. He had a soft, confiding sort of a voice that sent a little thrill through her. The funny thing was, and Mr. Jones, if asked, would have said it was the same with him, afterwards she couldn't recall a single thing he had said. The stranger remained in his room all the next day, which was Christmas Eve. At four o'clock, the occupant of room five, Mr. Perkins, a dealer in agricultural supplies, interrupted Mr. Jones, who was dozing at the desk, to tell him he was leaving a day earlier than intended. He was sorry for any inconvenience, but could he have his bill straight away as he was in a hurry? Mr. Jones, annoyed both to be woken up and to be thus left out of pocket, added ten pounds to the bill and assured Mr. Perkins that it was no trouble at all. At six o'clock, Bernard Morgan, a rep for a door-to-door -door perfume company, appeared at the desk with his suitcase and said he, too, was leaving early. Mr. Jones's eyebrows rose. Bernard Morgan had spent Christmas in room four every year for the last eight years. But before he could ask the reason, the man had signed his bill and was bustling out of the building. Usually so careful to check his expenses, Mr. Morgan had not even taken the time to spot the supplemental charge of twenty pounds he was paying for absolutely no reason at all. A flustered Mr. Jones consoled himself that surely the others, all three of them long-term residents, would not budge. 
Ten minutes later, Mr. Parrish, from room three, an ejected husband who had been with them for six weeks, and Mr. Hughes, from room two, a pink-shirted young man who had arrived the very same evening as Mr. Parrish and had asked for an adjoining room, appeared with their bags and demanded their bills. A flabbergasted and exasperated Mr. Jones calculated what they owed, overcharging each of them by seventy-five pounds. As a pale-looking Mr. Hughes headed for the exit in pursuit of Mr. Parrish, Mr. Jones hastened after him. But why are you going? Why is everyone leaving? Mr. Hughes cast him a haggard look. It's the sobbing, look you. Can't stand another minute of it, either of us. The sobbing? But they were gone. Bewildered, Mr. Jones turned to his desk, where he was joined by an equally puzzled and suspicious Mrs. Jones. Why is everyone leaving? What have you done? Mr. Jones shrugged, just as Miss Butler, the tiny and seemingly immortal spinster who had been with them since Mr. Jones Sr. had been in charge, appeared at the other side of the desk. A gust of gin-laden breath wafted from her as she focused on them over the counter. Kindly get me a taxi. I'm not staying for Christmas this year. Mr. and Mrs. Jones goggled down at her. Not staying? But, but why? Mr. Jones struggled out. Miss Butler pulled a face. It's that man in room six, and the noise he makes, most disturbing, she sniffed. I suppose you know who he is. Mr. and Mrs. Jones exchanged blank looks. Who? Why, he's the devil, of course. The tiny woman fished a piece of paper out of her pocket and placed it on the counter. I am going to my sister's. You can ring me at this number when it's safe to return. I shall wait outside for the taxi, I think. Miss Butler pushed herself away from the desk and tottered through the front door. In a daze, Mr. Jones phoned for a taxi and joined his wife in the little office behind reception. Well, that's the lot of them. Would you believe it? Even that pair of fairy cakes and that deformed old crone, gone, every last one of them. Except him, Mrs. Jones responded, jerking her eyes up at the ceiling. Mr. Jones followed her glance and swore with exasperation. The devil, indeed. Another sad loser like the rest of them, more like. I suppose you're right, agreed Mrs. Jones. He must be very noisy to have upset them all like that. He didn't look like one of those oversensitive types. Perhaps he's gay. They cry a lot. Mr. Jones frowned. He's not the devil. He can't be. The devil doesn't exist. Of course not. It's ridiculous. They must have been at the sherry. Quite right. Unless... Unless... You don't suppose... What? Well, that... He... Is? For a long moment, neither of them said anything. Then Mrs. Jones, tight-lipped, got up from her chair, stalked through the reception, and padded towards the stairs. Mr. Jones followed. The building was unnaturally quiet. The couple paused on the main landing, but heard nothing and carried on up, taking care to make no sound. At the door of room six, Mrs. Jones placed her fleshy ear against the wood panelling. At first she could make nothing out, but then there came to her straining ear a low, insistent sobbing. The person within was weeping, juddering, heart-broken sobs. Mrs. Jones motioned to her husband to listen, and Mr. Jones placed his ear against the door. The intensity of the sobbing that came from within was disturbing in the extreme. No wonder the other guests had all taken fright. He withdrew and mouthed at Mrs. Jones. What shall we do? Mrs. Jones mouthed back. I don't know. Then she added, knock. Mr. Jones gaped at her. What? Go on, knock. His wife mouthed back. Mr. Jones shook his head. Mrs. Jones rolled her eyes, then pushed him away and raised her hand. Suddenly, with her hand poised in midair, the sobbing stopped. Mrs. Jones froze, startled. The two of them stared at the closed door as silence surged around them. The sense of the stranger on the other side of the door listening to them, knowing they were there, was overwhelming. No, more than that, it was terrifying. Mr. Jones backed towards the stairs. 
Mrs. Jones saw she was being deserted and recognized at once that she was not prepared to stay there alone in the darkness. The couple descended the staircase in unreasoning haste, still trying to make no noise. Before they had reached even the main landing, the sobbing, louder now, had begun once more. Safely back in reception, Mr. and Mrs. Jones avoided each other's eyes and tried to appear busy. Mr. Jones cleared his throat, opened the register with a business-like jerk of the thumb, and ran his finger down to the most recent entry. At the very least, he would charge something to their unsettling guest's credit card for the trouble he was causing them, something substantial, a decent Christmas present in compensation for the inconvenience. The name in the register was illegible, and Mr. Jones's brow furrowed as he read the number he had jotted down alongside it the previous day. That can't be right, he muttered, wondering how he could have failed to notice it before. What can't? asked Mrs. Jones, dry-voiced. Mr. Jones turned the register so she could read the number. But it's just a row of sixes, she whispered. She looked up at her husband, her eyes wide with terror. Whoever saw a card with a number like that? The stranger did not come down for dinner, for which Mr. and Mrs. Jones were both grateful. As soon as the dinner hour had passed, they turned out the lights and went early to bed. They slept fitfully through Christmas Eve, their slumbers disrupted by nightmares. Around midnight, Mr. Jones jolted awake and lay stiff with fear in the blackness, wondering what had disturbed him. There was a sound coming from somewhere above. He tried to deny it, to identify it as the ululation of a faraway police siren, but in truth he knew it to be the anguished wailing of a human voice. At eight o'clock on Christmas morning, Mr. and Mrs. Jones huddled over a pot of tea in the little kitchen after their broken night, listening to the rain outside, neither saying anything or even wishing the other a Merry Christmas. They did not care to admit the way their thoughts were turning concerning the stranger in room six. "'Shall I turn on the radio?' asked Mrs. Jones at length. It's Christmas. It'll only be one of those dreadful carol services. But Mrs. Jones had already turned the switch. The kitchen filled with the sound of choristers in a distant English church. Though Christmas had no welcome at the Black Penny boarding house, the music afforded both Mr. and Mrs. Jones a small degree of comfort. Then the stranger appeared at the doorway. He paused on the threshold, haggard and scowling as the music rose to a crescendo. When he narrowed his bloodshot eyes in the direction of the radio, it switched off abruptly. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, in their dressing gowns, stared at the man, terrified. "'It's cold up there,' he told them. "'I tried to put the fire on, but there's something wrong with the plug. Besides, I felt like company,' said the stranger in his handsome voice." on this day of all days. Oh, said Mr. Jones. Ah, uh, is it down? The stranger slumped into a chair between them and raised his hands to his face. I didn't sleep, he told them, rubbing his eyes. I rarely sleep. Mrs. Jones poured a cup of tea with a shaky hand and pushed it across the table. Have a cup of tea. The stranger focused on the single Christmas card that stood on the table next to the teapot. The star of Bethlehem shone over a pink and white stable from which a golden glow emanated. He picked it up and opened it. Who's Ewan? he asked. The postman. After a tip, I expect, said Mrs. Jones. He won't get it, said Mr. Jones. He's new. He'll give up after a year or two. The stranger crumpled the card in his hand and let it fall to the table, then raised his eyes and fixed Mrs. Jones with a steady look. I don't care for Christmas. Mrs. Jones felt her heart pounding as she stared at the crushed card. We don't either. Not really. It's a, a difficult time of year. Difficult, yes, said the stranger. I used to love it a long time ago. His voice tailed off for a moment. You people don't seem to think it important any more. You behave like it's any other day. No one has any faith in anything. As he spoke, his voice vibrated with a mesmeric intensity, 
It's the pity of it all, the sheer hopelessness that I can't bear. Mr. Jones nodded and sipped nervously from his cup, unable to tear his gaze away from the mangled card in front of him. It can be hard being on your own at Christmas, Mrs. Jones offered after a moment or two. The stranger sighed, a sigh that came from very deep down. I always go away over Christmas, somewhere no one can find me. It makes a break before New Year and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, yes, said Mrs. Jones. New Year gets very busy. Mr. Jones grunted. Christmas and New Year are very busy for us, too, usually. The stranger did not seem to notice the insinuation. Trade slows a little around now. I leave things to my associates. Mr. Jones licked his lips. What line of business are you in, exactly? The stranger stared at his hands for a moment. Personnel. Human resources. Mr. and Mrs. Jones exchanged anxious glances. But you're not the boss. I was demoted some time since. Ah. It was a sideways move. Human resources, Mrs. Jones responded, trying to sound brighter and more confident than she felt. Isn't that what they call hiring and firing? Firing, chiefly, replied the stranger. Yes, many, many fires. His voice trailed off, and the three of them lapsed into silence. May I ask why you chose here in particular for your little break? asked Mrs. Jones at length. It was recommended. Really? said Mr. Jones, startled. Who by? An accountant from Bilth Wells, Di Jeffries. He stayed here once. Mr. Jones's brow furrowed. Di Jeffries? Wasn't that the name of that creepy, bald-headed character who killed himself a while back after being accused of molesting young girls? He shook his head. He needed to concentrate. Personnel, you say? Is it a big company, one we might have heard of? The stranger breathed out, taking his time. Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, come, come, he said, his fingers drumming upon the table. You know who I am. In your hearts you both know. Mr. Jones's mouth dropped open, and his face went ashen white. Mrs. Jones clutched her hands together as the colour drained from her flabby cheeks. You mean, whispered Mrs. Jones, oh, Christ, Mr. Jones breathed. No, the other one. Silence reigned in the little kitchen. The stranger got up after a while and crossed to the window, where he winced at the rain-soaked morning landscape. Christmas. Each year it gets harder. Mrs. Jones watched him, not daring to move. Despite her terror, she could not help thinking he looked vulnerable somehow. And was that a tear in his eye? You won't be going to church? the stranger asked, examining an egg cup with souvenir from Anglesey inscribed upon it. N no, answered Mr. Jones. I don't hold with it. I see. The stranger turned his unsettling, penetrating gaze on Mr. Jones, as though seeing clear through to his very soul. Yes, I see. I go to chapel occasionally, stammered Mrs. Jones. The stranger shook his head. No, you don't. You haven't been since your father took you when you were eleven. You told him it was rubbish, and he was a fool if he believed in all that God stuff. You didn't even go to his funeral. He didn't like that. Mrs. Jones gasped. My father? You, you've you met my father? Only in passing. He was bound elsewhere. Mrs. Jones clutched at the table. The whole room, the whole world, had started to sway crazily. You mean it's all true, Mr. Jones whispered in awe. What the churches say about sin and heaven and hell and, and everything? The stranger pulled a face. I don't know why you're so surprised. It was all written down for you. It could hardly have been made any plainer. You know the rules, or you should do. I thought everybody in Wales read the Bible. The stranger raised his nose and sniffed the air. But you don't even have a copy in the house, do you? 
he murmured. I would know if you did. Mr. Jones shrank into his chair as the man moved behind him, brushing his hand along the top of the backrest. But a Bible would be out of place here. How can you rifle through a guest's belongings when there's a copy of the Holy Testament screaming at you from the bedside table? How can you help yourselves to the loose change from the suits in the wardrobe when the word of the Lord is shrieking in your ear? The stranger passed from behind Mr. Jones's chair to that of Mrs. Jones. How can you dab yourself behind the ears with their expensive perfume and steal their earrings when the Lamb of God is in the room with you? Not to mention all the other things you two get up to. No, a Bible would be inconvenient, I see that. The stranger completed his circuit of the room and paused at the window again. He picked up the egg cup he had examined before. What a ghastly thing! Do you remember who gave it to you, Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones frowned, white as a sheet, and shook his head. Mr. Jones Sr. That time he took your dying mother for one last special holiday in a caravan near Hollyhead. He replaced the egg cup and resumed his consideration of the view through the window. Mr. Jones Sr. does not like me, he ruminated. Your wife is right to think of putting him away, or something. Poison, a little push downstairs. But I'm sure I can leave that to you. Yes, I know I can. You're my kind of people. Mr. and Mrs. Jones remained rooted to their seats, stunned by the realization that this stranger knew everything about them, their innermost thoughts even. Mrs. Jones, full of trepidation of what this man knew about her and of what he might do, felt tears well up in her eyes. Mr. Jones stared in horror at the man's back, incapable of rational thought. Sometimes, the stranger went on, I ask myself, what's the point? It all seems more trouble than it's worth. If no one believes in anything any more, why should I bother? Why should I suffer like I do? Perhaps there is no God. In which case, what am I for? How can there be any me at all? I used to be so impressive before. I used to have a tail and horns and a forked tongue. Now all the popular imagination can manage for their embodiment of supreme evil is a politician or a banker. Mrs. Jones's mouth worked soundlessly. At last she managed to speak in a tiny, frightened voice. Have you come for us? The stranger swivelled on his heel, an eyebrow raised. Come for you. It's Christmas. I'm on holiday. Mrs. Jones caught her breath, a wave of relief sweeping over her. Of course, the man went on, and that doesn't mean I won't some day. The look of relief on Mrs. Jones's face faded. Mr. Jones struggled to clear his mind and swallowed hard. Is there no way out for us? Nothing we can do? Redemption, you mean? The stranger pursed his lips. There's the option of repentance and forgiveness, of course, but it's only afforded to those who demonstrate complete honesty, make full recompense, hold nothing back. You would have to change your ways entirely. Are you sure you are capable of that? Mr. and Mrs. Jones looked at one another. We might like to try, said Mrs. Jones, her voice quaking. The stranger shrugged. It's up to you, I suppose. Curiously, I sometimes get the slimmest pickings in houses where there are no Bibles, where the occupants have opted to live decent, honest lives regardless of any threat of punishment or the allure of heavenly rewards, to be good for no reason at all, in fact, beyond their own goodness. That leaves me nothing to work with. How can I undermine their faith when they have no faith to be undermined? God becomes powerless, too. We might as well not exist. We could be good, Mr. Jones realized, staring at Mrs. Jones. If we chose to be, said Mrs. Jones, finishing the thought for him. The stranger shot the pair of them a look of distaste. If you two are going to start repenting, I shall go to my room. 
He stepped to the door, then turned back. Do you have any holiday reading to pass the time? Something light? Tom Sharp? One of the Flashman stories? There are some old paperbacks in reception, Mr. Jones faltered. The stranger nodded and left the room. Mr. and Mrs. Jones heard him cross the reception, pause at the bookshelf in the corner with its pitiful selection of crusty paperbacks, hum for a second or two, and then mount the stairs, step after heavy step. At last there came the distant opening and closing of the door to room six. Mr. and Mrs. Jones spent the rest of Christmas Day frantic with fear, feverish in their determination to change their ways. Mr. Jones cut up his list of guests' credit card numbers. Mrs. Jones vowed to return everything she had stolen, or, if that was not practicable, to give it all to charity. Both were adamant that in future they must be completely honest both with each other and with the clientele. Mr. Jones took Mrs. Jones's flabby hands in his and admitted, in a voice shaking with emotion, that he had not always shared his takings fairly with her. Mrs. Jones, equally tearful and much to Mr. Jones's surprise, forgave him and admitted she had done exactly the same. That night Mr. and Mrs. Jones clutched each other hour after hour, not daring to close their eyes. Instead of the sobbing and wailing of the previous two nights, now there was only silence, a silence so complete it unnerved them even more. The stranger checked out early on Boxing Day. True to his newly made resolutions, and with Mrs. Jones at his side, Mr. Jones made out the bill with complete accuracy and did not insert any additional items. When he pushed the bill over the desk, however, he was met with a stony stare, and his courage faltered. There's no charge, Mr. Jones mumbled, withdrawing the piece of paper. The stranger considered them both amused before carrying his bag to the door, where he hesitated. Mr. and Mrs. Jones held their breath, fearing they would never be free of him. A wan smile, the first they had seen on his lips, creased the man's face. Next Christmas, he told them, you must come to mine. Then he was gone. Mr. and Mrs. Jones ran to the window and watched his retreating back all the way down the road, until he was hidden by the wall of the neighbouring cemetery. Not for several minutes did they dare to believe that he had finally departed, and that their lives were their own again. Then they held on to each other in a fierce embrace, helpless with relief. They even broke out in spontaneous dance, throwing their arms and legs about as though drunk, and whooped and yelled as if it was a party. At the same time, they both began, privately, to unthink their hasty resolutions. Mr. Jones wondered if he might be able to tape the cut-up list of credit card numbers together again. Mrs. Jones, for her part, speculated whether Mr. Jones Sr. would detect poison in his bedtime cocoa. If someone had told them that they would choke to death that very afternoon as they lay boozily in each other's arms and the black penny boarding house burned to the ground around them, they would have thought it a sick joke. Up in room six, the faulty electric plug on the three-bar fire began to smoulder. <laughs>